You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Jody Alexander, who is Chief Operating Officer of the Central Florida YMCA. Jody, how are you on this Friday afternoon? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for agreeing to join. I'm, I've been um, really excited to have you on because when we met, you remember when we met, right? I remember. February of 2020, you were kind enough to come into our office and present to to, to my team and you know, little did we know within the next what week or two because i think it was the end of february we had a couple people who were sick and we were looking at them sideways not really <laughs> too concerned at the yep. time but um the, you know the world the world turned upside down immediately after that did you ever see that coming absolutely did not i look back on that and i'm thinking there is no way we could have gone to talking to a room full of young leaders and almost two weeks later world shut down. It was it's just unbelievable. Yeah. So everything you had planned, you know, you, you know, running the day-to-day operations of the YMCA, it, you know, you didn't have a plan for that, did you? No, you know, I've been uh, in operations of the YMCA for over 30 years, and I would like to think I would have a plan for everything. And it was, our conference room has a huge whiteboard on it, and we completely filled it that Friday, the next Friday afternoon, actually, on all the things you had to consider knowing we were going to shut down. And how many employees do you guys have here? We had at that moment, we had 2,200 employees. Massive, a massive organization. It was massive. And we closed on March 17th. And on March 19th, the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life career is laid off 2000 employees, furloughed, furloughed 2000 employees on March 19th. And so I have to ask, and I didn't, I didn't realize that actually. Um, I mean, I knew you, you guys had to take drastic action. Of course, you know, as much as any business, yours you know, is one that could not operate during that time, quite the opposite. How'd you, how'd you handle that? I mean, that's, that's, I just gut wrenching is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, it, 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 it was gut, gut wrenching. And, you know, we tried to be as human as we could. And honestly, we made tons and tons and tons of phone calls. Um, and I mean, we, we kind of designed a process. And one of the things that we didn't want to do is just feel like a, an organization or a company that it is big and is a big, bigger employer and just send out a blanket email and just say, sorry, don't come, you know, don't come to work. But we thought through all the things we could still offer them. We still continued health insurance through the entire closure. We still allowed accrual of PTO, you know, all of the things, even not knowing anything, not knowing when are we coming back? How many employees can we come back? But we tried to be as human, the type of organization that we are, right? That serves people and caring for our staff and that. How long, how long were you close for? When were you guys able to bring members back? Yeah, we were close for about seven, seven and a half weeks. Our first, um, we phased our openings and May 21st was the first time we were able to bring four of our locations back up and running. And then we phased four at a time for the next several weeks because just as difficult of closing down was opening back up. Right, <laughs> and, sure. And, you know, you when, when you open up a brand new location because you've built it from the ground up. There's, you know, a sequence that you go through, but when you have 18 locations and 2,200 staff and, you know, trying to figure and all kinds of new guidelines, right? All kinds of new guidelines that you're trying to piece through. Um, we took our time in trying to, you know, process through that and figure that out. So, and, and, and not everything opened again. So. Right. I mean, it, it's, you know, even now when, when you go in, I, I had to go get blood work uh, earlier this week and I and don't even think about wearing a mask anymore. It's just, it's not part of the, the routine at this point, but I went into a Quest lab and I walk in the lobby, everyone's wearing a mask. I still didn't put, put one on and then they came out and said, you have to wear one. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> okay. We're still not back to normal, but where are you guys on that spectrum as far as being, you know, normal? Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't, I think new normal is probably really where we're going to be. It's, it's hard to shed, um, you know, there's going to be always that moment in time pre-pandemic. I say it all the time, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. It's probably really, we're an endemic, you know, to be honest, we're not really all the way past it. So I think it's more new normal um, and accepting that. Um, I don't even benchmark against, you know, pre-COVID numbers of, you know, our, even our, our um, revenue or how many memberships we had, all that kind of stuff, because I think people have figured out um, lifestyles have all changed. So, right. um, you know, so we're kind of uh, reinventing and, uh, and really allowing the pandemic to be a bit of a disruptor and seeing, you know, how do we look and be different you know, there were probably a few signs we needed to do that anyways. And that's that's everything from the workforce and the staffing plans and taking care of staff and our philosophies and how we've shifted and changed some things, you know, all the way down to customer, uh, you know, end user and how we're delivering um, because I think people's needs have changed. And I think we, we've had to figure out how to meet people where they are and define differently what what that is. Well, if anyone was equipped to do it, it would be you. And and I say that because do you, do you remember the book that you talked about when you came in in February 2020? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm such a, a reader. Uh, you might have to remind me. I'm not sure which one I was even referring to then. Blue Ocean Strategy. Oh, my Blue Ocean. Yeah, that is one of my favorites. My Blue. So I, I bought it and read yeah. it immediately after you you recommended it. And, um, you know, it talks about innovation and, and change. Um, you know, one of the quotes from, from the book that, that's resonated with me was, um, uh, create, don't compete. And that's what you just described. Uh, yeah. and, and so how fitting that you're someone who, you know, like I said, was, is if anyone was equipped to handle that, it was you. So what, what are some of the changes that you've made? Yeah. Um, so, uh, several things. We're actually looking through an entire reinvention of how we take, programming and product to the community. And so our, our typical business model has been, as a YMCA, as a nonprofit, we have our YMCA membership is really the revenue source. It's the engine. It is what drives everything. And so you're going to have those locations that are going to be in suburban locations that have all of the revenue, but we want to make sure we're serving all in the community. That's part of our mission. So we still have locations where it's a membership um, model isn't going to, you know, it's you're not going to generate a lot of cash off of it, but we know that people need healthy living and youth development and all of the things that come with that. So what has happened is we had that model where those wise would throw off enough cash to be able to have locations in our Pine Hills area or our um, South Orlando, Oak Ridge and OBT areas where you're not going to have as much of a, a, a strong membership base. Well, when you close locations, you know, have revenue coming in your main, you know, form of revenue. And we dropped to 50%. Wow. So we went from a $70 million organization to a $35 million organization almost overnight. I'm, I bet. Wow. So it, it's you, you all of a sudden saw the major flaw in something that you have felt that's institutional that you know it has stood the test of time for decades so it immediately you know showed showed the flaw from that perspective but it also gave us the opportunity to say you know what there's also a reason that in some of our locations memberships not the thing you know that are those is that really what that community needs so instead of having a one size fits all approach we've really had the opportunity to look and say you know what how do we look at all of this differently? And then how do we partner with others to do what we're really good at, which is have really great buildings in locations where people can get to them. They feel safe with our brand. They feel safe interacting with us. They know a little bit about us, but bring programs and services that look and feel you know, different. So you know, we've kind of done that reinvention. We do a lot of voice of customer surveying and really understanding what it is that people want. We're in a market research study right now and fascinating the things we thought people wanted. People want gathering spaces. Mm. People want a, a place to, in an unstructured way, just get together and have indoor play areas for their children. Um, and, you know, so much of what we do is, is register for this, register for this. you got to pick this time. You've got to pick that time. So how do we continue to fill the idea of bring people together, but 
listen to the community and navigate ways of, you know, of doing that. So silver lining almost? Yeah, it's been needed. It's actually been one of those things, you know, we, we've talked around the why for quite a while. It's very difficult to be nimble when you're a, a larger organization. You know, there's 850 YMCA associations, 2,000 different locations across the country, and we're in 110 countries, I think. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize the international it, scope. Wow. Huge. Yeah, it actually started um, in England. Um, in London, England in 1844. So I had no yeah. idea. Wow, yeah, that is neat. Yeah, I came to the United States in 1851 in Boston. Uh, I was just in Boston last weekend. I, I, I would have known. I would have found that, that first location. Do you know where it is? Yeah, time? so um, no, I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't even know if I've even had a chance to visit it. But um, it's probably not a YMCA anymore. Yeah, they, they, Probably one the, not. One of the things that I saw in the Freedom Trail was the oldest bookstore is now a Chipotle. The, the first oh boy that's the sign that times have changed and <laughs> even worse it was a, it was a closed chipotle it's not it's not open right now but uh, uh, yeah, yeah times have changed a little bit um but well, i didn't i had no idea the why had that uh, i just assumed the history was from from the u.s yeah no and you know in central florida we're actually was we're kind of a, a young ymca we really didn't get our footing until uh the late 1800s is when we were established, but nothing really took off until uh, mid 1960s, okay. um, where a group of volunteers just came together and they said, you know, we, we really need to establish some locations. And so picking back on the Boston, the very first location is was at um, the uh, Lake Eola, I think it's Persimmons Hollow brewing right now right on okay. robinson <laughs> yeah, yeah i know where that is no, wow. i think it was a hotel it was a a, a a panera bread i think it was a jail way you know way back when so now you um and we'll talk more about this in a minute your your the the long history you've had with your career at the y of of 30 years more than 30 years yeah it'll be uh start 33 in september 33 i mean that is that's fascinating. So I want to get into that a little bit, but I will say, you know, I grew, uh, my kids were, were um, well, they all were raised here. One was born in Tampa, then, then we moved to Jacksonville. One was there for, for the very brief time we spent, and then uh, the other two were born here. But we all, you know, from the time my oldest was three years old, we were at the Y every Saturday playing soccer. Um, I can tell you those are some of the best memories I've had as a parent. Um you know, the friendships we've made last today, my oldest is now 22. So, um, you know, the kids are long, you know, gone from, from those days, unfortunately. But I, I mean, what a, what a wonderful thing, you know, for the community that just touches so many lives everywhere you go. And, you know, the impact I know that you've had to have had locally, the buildings, when I first started going, the, 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 we live on Southwest part of town and it was called, um, I don't know if it was the Ocoee YMCA, it's now the Roper YMCA, sure, yeah. but, and, 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 but when that building was redone, it's as nice as anything you could see. The Dr. Phillips YMCA is just unbelievably nice. So is that part of your mission is to, is going yeah. forward? Yeah, you know, it, 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 um, YMCAs don't happen without community leaders. YMCA doesn't happen without, you know, donors and philanthropists and partners that help to kind of, you know, pull it all together. And the Roper family is, you know, in the Dr. Phillips charities, those are, you know, right there, just two of the YMCAs that, you know, you mentioned there, those are grassroots community leaders that grew up in the YMCA um, and really understand, you know, values oriented, a place for people to come together, you know, the, the, the safe aspect of it, the socialization that can, you know, can come from it. So, um, you, you know, that is exactly what we try to do in every aspect to be a community convener, right, to kind of lean in, listen, and figure out what it is that we can do that adds value to the community. What, what a neat thing. And I hadn't thought about it until this moment because I just took it for granted. You know, we'd go to the Y and that's where we'd play soccer and t-ball and basketball. And um, I coach there around, you know, around the clock. And um, thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate that a ton. Uh, I mean, so many good times and we just take it for granted. Um, and, and, you know, I, these things don't happen by accident, which is what you're saying, right? It takes other people to, to get involved. I mean, how do you, how do you solicit that? How, how do you 
how do you get people to step up? I mean, that has to be, that's a major effort. Yeah, you know, um, we are very fortunate in Central Florida where we have generational leaders. So you do have family members or organizations that have leaned in for since the beginning, right? Those, those community leaders and, you know, and those volunteers from that perspective. But most recently, some of the things that we're trying to do is we continue to define um, the things that we're good at and um, the things that we feel necessary in the community. And then how do the buildings or the locations and the programs that we have serve that need, right? Is we've, we've defined three very specific areas that are gonna be our lanes. Um, and our lane is going to be drowning prevention because drowning is at an all time high. And we're surrounded by water um, in an Orange County and Seminole uh, and um, Osceola County, we've hit all time high. So we're gonna do everything that we can with swim lessons, drowning, awareness, all those things. Out of school time enrichment. So we we look at it as we're extension of the extracurricular activities, you know, things from the school time. And then community health, being okay. able to really be that chronic disease prevention, evidence-based socialization, mental health, all of those things that, you know, food stabilization, um, safety, uh, you know, uh, connector of resources. So when you start to define your scope and where you're going to be, there's natural alignment that happens and you can find people's passion points for, you know, so we have, we have a volunteer group that's a drowning prevention group. And these are people that might've had an, you know, a family member with a near drowning or a drowning they are people that are like that have seen, you know, we were talking about swimming. So you, right. the people that have seen lifelong value in swimming, whether it's through sport or boating or going to the beach. And, you know, they they want to make sure that everyone in our community has the opportunity to kind of go down that continuum. So, you know, when you define your message and who you are as an organization, that helps us almost at a grassroots level, figure out who to partner with and, you know, how to say, this is how you can get involved. That, that's really neat. And and I, I get that you, you know, as I think through, you know, my life and, and the evolution with my kids, uh, you know, there was a time where we were, it was just such a part really of every weekend. And then now it's not, my kids are older, they're, you know, my youngest starting high school. How do you bridge that gap? Because I could see that at a later day, you know, when you, you, you know, I, I would I would guess that that would be a struggle, right? To, to get those people kind of in between when you, you know, we're so busy, you're raising kids, you, you know, you're, you're, they're all over the place. And then when your life slows down, but, but, um, yeah, I, I would guess you'd see a lot of people leave for a while and then come back, but. We absolutely do, do, do see that. It's interesting, you know, because I'm also, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, the organization has to have a business mind to it also, right? So that's the only way we can deliver back to the community and investing back in the community. So yes, sure. I watch the membership numbers. I see how many, you know, overall households we're reaching and how many don't stay with us. And, you know, we, we at any given time are about 41% of the, what you would consider new memberships are rejoin memberships. Okay. Oh, neat. So, so we embrace it. There are going to be seasons in life and there's going to be cycles in life when you're going to, you know, kind of come in and come, come out and, 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 you know, and that's okay. And what we want to be strategic about. And so it's a, it's an interesting example. We actually struggle as a nation and, you know, certainly here locally a little bit with um, the, with millennials. Um, we, uh, you know, used to be the largest generation took over baby boomers, but now what is it? Gen why that I think is the largest generation. I think so they so, just took yeah. over millennials. And, but back in the 90s and early 2000s, we cut all the teen programs, like budgets got tight, or um, we thought schools were doing it, you know, and so we cut all the teen programs. And so we lost that connection. We lost that emotional, you know, I grew up. Much, the baby boomers grew up with us. You can right. talk to the baby boomer and they're going to say, oh, I was a part of high Y after school club. I was a part of gray Y. They'll tell you all the clubs and, you know, tell you all about the YMCA. So we also be very intentional about fulfilling the need, but, you know, also creating that continuum of connection and know people, you know, let people know um, that we are here if they do need us. 
Okay, well, uh, uh, so you don't need any advice from me, but I, I will I do. say that, um, well, as a parent, and this is cliche, but true, you know, when I was growing up, I'd get on my bike, I would ride up. Now, it wasn't why I was in Gainesville, Florida. We had a boys club near the area, and I would go there, and I'd spend all day and, and come home when it was dark. You know, the typical story here, right? And now kids don't do that. And I think that would be such an opportunity for the benefit of, of our youth to, to get them out and to be able to spend the day hanging around. Because you know, the, you know, the YMCA's that I've um, gone to regularly, either the ones near, near work or, or near my house, um, you know, there's plenty of places to play and, and, and hang out. I mean, is that an effort that you guys have, have tried to push at all? Yeah, that is a lot of our program reinvention. You know, it's interesting. We've talked for a lot of years about the membership model and you hear it in so many industries, right? We hear it all over. You got, we want people to belong. We want people to belong, but it's really about what it is that you offer inside of the construct of a membership. A membership is just a way to pay for something, right? right? It's a subscription. Right. It's a subscription, right? It's just a way to, to, to pay for it. So if you, you ha- we, um, and this is part of our kind of reinvention right now, we've got to be, um, very specific about leaning in on the different um, programs that kids are interested in. So I'll give you a perfect example. We're piloting right now one, two, three, four locations where we're working in esports. Okay. So we've got an esports league, right? Interesting. And so we're yep. And oh my goodness, we have kiddos that in middle school that never would participate in a basketball league or participate in, you know, maybe, a, a, you know, they, they haven't come to us for something. So reaching an entirely new market because that's what they're interested in. Yeah, yeah. That's the hook, right? That's the hook. Um, but what else do we want to do with that? Well, we want to help them network. We want to help them think about, you know, post post high school choices for, um, for career or post second, you know, education, things like that. So we're looking at the program things or the environment to your point, right? We're looking at all of our environments. We're looking at, um, you know, places for kids to come hang teen centers. We, We haven't had those in most of our locations for decades. So now we're repurposing space. Yeah. The, you know, the, um, the, I just had a call yesterday with a company who was building a esports um, club, and I, I they they were referring to the the kids as athletes, and oh, they're yeah. like these are esports athletes, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know that's uh-huh. that takes I have to wrap my brain around that. My kids, you know, I have three boys who spend a lot of time with a controller. I know your, your son, um, oh, yes. you know, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a little older than it, and my kid still does that a lot. Right. And I may or may not have done that well into my, um, my, my older age, but, uh, it's, it, you, you can ignore it, but you're only doing yourself a disservice and that's what the kids want to do. And it's a very social thing, but the downside as a parent and and I think as you know as someone who cares about the future of, of our young generation um it, it keeps them inside and you, know, you, you have to get out you know being you know social over an internet connection just isn't the same and you know you, you have to be out you have to you, you know you just can't be in, under your own roof all the time and, and um and see some so, daylight every now and then yeah it's a, but it's a, but it is a very social thing and I, I can't deny that and you learn teamwork and you have to communicate i mean there's a lot of benefits to it so that's that's really neat that you guys are um are, are well you know and the, the approach is doing it in locations where the kids come together right, right? and yes. so establishing the club so we're not gonna we're not gonna get into the virtual and everybody's at home, you know, this is more coming together and, yeah. we, you know, establishing a club and, um, you know, the, there's so many things that you can lean into just, just, just following out youth development and thinking about what it is that we're trying to do in an enrichment perspective and generating interest, you know, from a business perspective, there's marketing involved in esports. There's yep. development, developing, right? So being a programmer, there is um, uh, graphics and artwork, you know, so getting them hooked by that, but then understanding and connecting them in some of the other programming that we do 
to kind of lead towards career exploration opportunities as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's so it's and it's it's such a big business. It's only going to grow. Um, and there's so much that goes into it, like you said, that, that those skills can transfer. And what I found out recently is that there's scholarships offered for, um, yeah. for yeah. play, you know, at, by, from colleges, which is, which is. My son uh, often reminds well. me that because I put the timer on his Xbox, that he probably could have been top in the world. That's right. Uh, <laughs> right. A little bit. Little so, you know. Another parenting fail. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll reserve the opinion on that, whether that was a fail. Um, but I, I want to shift if we can to talk about you a little bit, um, because your career, you know, almost 33 years with one organization, you I know, I know this wasn't, uh, you, you said your first job, I read on your bio that you started as a lifeguard in 1989. But after you got out of school, where did you did you start with the why right away? Um, as a grad? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I guess, a, a YMCA lifer, um, meaning I took, I think, my first swim lesson at like five years old. <laughs> so, weird. you know, it's really, it's, it's interesting because I also like to think what I'm doing right now brings it, it's kind of full circle for me. So um, in, in the why we have something where we call, we have our why story, right? Our connection and, and why we're here and why we stay. Right. Um, and I started off as a, um, you know, swim lessons. I could ride my bike to my local Y in Ohio. Okay. And I did swim lessons. I did the overnights. I did, you know, I did all of those things. And um, I, I that's kind of what I knew from recreation. And I mean, I was on swim teams for, for years, um, uh, you know, from that, from that perspective, I was first generation college. So when I went to school, I had to have a job. And so I was like, okay, well, let me go to the YMCA. I know a little bit about that. I saw a little ad post that said for swim team coach. And I'm like, was on a swim team that's definitely qualifies me right <laughs> like, that, that, sure. that qualifies me I was on a swim team and I was so fortunate to meet the person that hired me a program director um, in Toledo Ohio where I went to school and he was just amazing and he he tells a story that um I only, I, I'm, I don't know if I answered any questions right, but he said, I did answer one question right when he said, you know, what do you think the main job is here as a swim team coach? And apparently I answered to be a role model. Okay. And so he was like, well done, ah, you know, so all those years of working with my own coaches and being a part of a YMCA, you know, somehow I either got lucky or I was smart enough. So, you know, he took a chance on me who had no swim team experience and I did everything I could to learn about how to train kids and, you know, and hang out, you know, with kids and, and, and stuff and, and, you know, and figure that out. So a lifeguard and a swim team coach. And did you do that all through college? I did it all through college. I also did before and after school child care. So I kind of stuck with the why. I had no intentions of making the why a career. I'm I sure, was right. in school for education okay. and I was going to be a teacher. I mean, I wanted to be a teacher in, you know, in the worst, worst way. I just was very passionate about it. But I had mentors along the way, all those folks that wrapped themselves around me at the why. And they're like, if you work for the why, you teach every day. He's like, you just get to teach in the way you want to teach and in areas that you're passionate about. So I was like, what? I don't even know there could be a career with the why. What does that even mean? <laughs> you know? And so I'm looking at these people and they're like, you know, like, like me, I'm an executive director of this YMCA. I was like, oh, wow. Wow. So I had great people around me, helped me land my very first job as an aquatic director. Okay. Um, yeah. Aquatic director. And here's a great one for you. I think my first salary was nineteen thousand dollars as an aquatic director, and I thought I was so rich. I bet, I bet <laughs> it was you did. Great. It was unbelievable. So I, I just, I just told the story the other day of my first salary um, in 1993. So I, I must have done something a little better. I, I had twenty three thousand four hundred. <laughs> that was man. And yeah, I was, <laughs> and I remember uh, I went to training for two weeks the weekend I graduated from FSU and and I had I was dating a girl who I was crazy about and um, and still I'm crazy about and we I, I came home and from training and I had a week's paycheck and it was you know how 
two hundred dollars, whatever it was. And we went to the movie, went and saw the firm that movie, and, oh, okay, yeah. um, which was a huge disappointment compared to the book. But that's that's a whole different story. And I remember standing in the lobby and looking at her like, you can buy whatever you want if you want popcorn and candy. If you want a large got this. Drink. Or I you know, had. You have never had, um, you know, there were times where I couldn't take out the minimum $10 from the ATM for the previous four years in school. And I thought that $23,400 salary was, yeah. was everything. Yeah, I made I'm it. I'm so proud of I it. I made it. So, it, and, and, job, yeah. yeah, and if it makes you feel better that after that job, my next salary, I think was 19. I did come backwards before <laughs> I went forward. So well, everybody <laughs> should start there. So, okay. <laughs> Okay. I don't think that's uh, too realistic anymore, fortunately, but, no, no, um, sure. but yeah, so you started out as an aquatic director and that was in, in Ohio still? Yeah, that was in Ohio and it was actually a small, um, smaller Y um, to the west of o Ohio. So I had left the Toledo, I was in the uh, Toledo Association, that's where I went to school and I went to um, a, a small Y and an independent Y. So we're all kind of structured a little bit differently and a little bit of a rural town. And I was like one of, you know, two program directors and I really missed the network. I missed, I missed the network. So I honestly didn't even, I think I lasted two years um, at that position before um, I was able to get back into the Toledo YMCA and I ex got to expand my role, probably didn't expand my salary, but I got to expand my role because I got to do aquatics and fitness. Okay. And, and, and I got the fitness role because I got to supervise fitness because in aquatics, I would do pool aquatics. So they said, well, clearly you're qualified to do fitness. So, <laughs> so I learned a whole new, uh, you know, program line and actually did wellness and fitness for about 15 years of my career. Wow. Okay. I added all kinds. So I discovered a real passion for leading classes and doing personal training and, you know, and doing all of that. But so you were, you were uh, very much getting to teach. So yeah, I, I had no idea what I was doing, but I learned, sure. I, you know, I learned, I figured it out. I now, how, what brought you to Florida? Uh, actually, the, the 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 YMCA did so. Um, 2009, and the world was kind of having you know major housing crashes, high unemployment, right? And Toledo is very kind of trickle down Detroit, right? So we okay. were experiencing um, a lot of. Um, unemployment and, you know, and, and challenges and, and in that system. And I, I don't think I would have, because my family still lives there. I don't think I would have ever left if potentially that, you know, didn't happen, but I had also reached a spot in my career where I had, you know, one of the higher positions and there was, there was going to be a little bit of a, a, a ceiling there. And so with everything that was happening and we were looking at closing down YMCA's, I really felt like I needed to get into a little bit bigger of a, a system. And I had talked to these guys, you know, here in central Florida a, a year before. And um, I was like, nah, nah, nah. I, I, you know, I'm really rooted in my family and it would have been a really big leap, you know, to be 20 years with one organization in one town. And, um, but we decided to go ahead and, you know, kind of take the chance and, um, We'll add to the great parenting moments. I actually moved my son to Florida on his 13th birthday. Oh, so, really? right, right in the middle oh, you of were school year. very I mean, popular. I, for I, that. You know, I, I know. I'm surprised he still speaks with me. <laughs> um, you know, and it was it was tough. It was a hard transition. Um, you know, just any kind of a move is, but it is, you know, we we just love this community. We love the YMCA, you know, in general, of course. But we love this community. I love what we do in this, you know, community. So well, you know, you you know, so you've you've moved up consistently, right? You're you're at you know at the top of this organization now as a chief operating officer. You're you're that's rare. You know that that to stay at the same organization for a long time. Um a and then B to succeed along the way and, and advance. Uh, it's something that I have you know, just massive ma admiration for because I know I couldn't do it. I know that I couldn't walk through those minefields. Um, I worked for two large corporations prior to starting, uh, you know, Four Corner Resources, and uh, yeah, there was just constant pitfalls everywhere. So, what's the secret? Yeah, because because it's a, it's it's a wonderful thing to 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 
I mean, how rewarding it, you know, to be able to have that kind of success, but also to see an organization grow and to be part of it. And it just, especially one that, um, you know, that you care about and it does so much good in the, in the community, but what, what has been your secret to, to isn't it, or maybe hopefully not a secret, right? Because we'd love uh, to share it. You know, I don't know if there's a secret. My, I'm, um, you know, a few years ago, I worked with an executive coach and I was talking to him about, you know, all kinds of different things. And um, I'm always on a self-discovery path. Matter of fact, you know, my family probably rolls their eyes and they're like, oh my gosh, this is another lesson. Seriously, you're going to teach us something else from this. But um, my, my coach asked me to describe myself in one word. Okay. And that was hard. I don't even remember actually the word that I, that I used, but he said, huh? He said, I just find you curious that I just describe you as curious. You just have a curiosity about you. And so one um, organization, but so many avenues to explore. And even in 33 years, I don't feel like I've probably even come close to unearthing all the things that are still out there for me to learn and to maybe, you know, put a different touch on or to put a different, you know, spin on. So it's, I, I can never be bored if I am constantly learning how to A, be a better leader and, you know, walk, help walk people through, you know, this organization, but also in just service to my community and figuring that out. So I drive my staff nuts. They'll tell you all day long because I'm probably pop shotting ideas all the time at them and look at this and look at this, you know, um, I'm a data, I'm a data geek too. I am constantly studying trends and numbers and looking for that thread that, you know, helps to optimize something or, um, you know, make something better, become, you know, more, more efficient. So, you know, that, that, that's probably a little bit more of the science side of the secret, you know, the curiosity is probably a little bit more of the art side. It's also emotional. Um, you know, the organization gave a lot to me growing up. They gave a sure. lot to, to me, right? And so when you look at somebody who takes a swim lesson and, you know, then can pass a lifeguard test and can become a lifeguard and then can go from lifeguard to, to, to being a professional leading in the organization. It's, you know, there's, there's, that's emotional. So the, the why's given a lot to me. So in the time that I'm at the, the, the helm as a, a staff leader, I want to be able to make sure that I can do the best that I can. The, um, you know, the, what you described in terms of curiosity and, and never running out of ideas and things to do. I, 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 you know, when I look at what I think about it constantly, what makes some one person successful and not another, right? What, what, what are those traits? And that one is something that I've started to think about a lot, probably over the last six months is that um, there's, you know, who's looking forward, who is, who is looking for, um, you know, at what they can do next and to take ownership of things, right? And, and as someone who has hired you know, young professionals for for many years i think that's probably the biggest differentiator for folks who have the ability to succeed and improve and advance is are, are those who are they're not being told what to do they're looking for things to do and i don't think you can teach that and i don't know where it comes from i'd love to find that right, secret. Right, that right. Is i like that right? secret sauce yeah but I think you, I don't know, it evolves somehow and, or maybe you're just born with it, you know, nature versus nurture, who, who knows really. But um, I, I, I really, that really resonates with me because I know as you're describing it, I go, I know exactly what that looks and feels like. And, and something that I think has helped me succeed uh, it, um, because I, my biggest problem is I don't have enough hours in the day where I go, I, there's 50 things that I will not get to do that I would like to be doing or need to do or feel compelled to do, whatever you want to, whatever phrase you want to put on it, right? But um, I guess I, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but I also realize, I think I, you know, have, over the years, I've thought, well, doesn't everyone feel that way? But I've realized, that, no, that's not the case. So it's pretty rare. Um, what about the, the politics? So you've had to, yeah, so of course you've had the ability, you've had to drive, but even though the why is, you know, a more wholesome organization than most, 
you can't escape the politics. So how, how have you navigated that so effectively? You know, um, and I probably had more politics in my career than maybe even most. So when I was mentioning being in Toledo and kind of getting to the ceiling of where um, I probably was going to be able to go was because my, um, my father-in-law actually was the CEO of the organization and okay. so you know just for sheer fact of you know reporting lines and you know and all of that we had to be super you know cautious of all of this yeah i was working for the toledo y he came to town and brought his son and i met him and you know 28 years later we're you know <laughs> still doing ymca stuff here oh that's so, cool i didn't know yeah, that we were both lifeguards oh um, no kidding all right so not only do we do these other great things, we also do matchmaking. So, you know, you can meet <laughs> yeah, your I bet, the I, bet, I bet there's more than a few relationships that have uh, totally started yeah, that way. Yeah. So I had, you know, I just always had this um, um, very goal directed, right? So I think behavior is goal directed. And so we were very goal oriented in what we wanted to do in serving the community. And when you keep that in your sight line, um, you know, it just always fueled me to try to be the best. I was the person who was always going to beat the numbers. I was the person who was, you know, just constantly bumping up against the top that I could. And so I think when you look at achieving or, and I'm highly competitive, my strength finders will tell you, I got, you know, achieving competition and strategic are like my top three learners, I think number four. So, you know, yeah, I bump up against those things. It's, not as difficult because you just kind of feel like you know you feel like you're winning so you 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 put your results behind you sure and so like i said i mentioned earlier it is a feel good organization but if there's no margin to the organization there's there's not going to be an organization so right. constantly having you know those goals and putting up you know putting a plan together so i'll tell you though as a don't you know you can you can cut me off if you don't want me to go there but being a, a woman leader yep. um you know there are very very few coos that are women across you know our country uh, from the ymca perspective um i'm the first coo that's a woman here in wow. Central florida no kidding um, okay yeah and so you know kind of grow growing up those were not as much internal to the why, but honestly, external. So my, my why in Ohio, my first executive director um, job, our YMCA is a suburb, suburban why, phenomenal why. And, you know, I was regularly, you know, hanging out with the, you know, the, the other community leaders in that town, you know, the, the school superintendent, the police chief, the mayor, you know, many of those were on my board. They were all men. Okay. And, you know, I joined Rotary so that I could, you know, network. And I think I was one of nine women um, in, you know, the, the entire Rotary Club. And I barely just joined. And we went to the community, went to the um, Christmas party. And I still I had the bit, they give you a big, you know, new Rotarian, you know, button so that people would seek you out and say hello to you and welcome you. And I can't tell you at that party, it was time after time after time that the members would walk up and they would shake my husband's hand. No say, kidding. Oh, are you, you know, and he's, he's, he's amazing. And he's like, Hey, I think you want to talk to my wife. <laughs> so, so, you know, so like, I, so from a politics perspective, I think it's just trying to find your seat at the table. So, you know, that's probably been more of a challenge for me than, you know, the interworkings of the, the, the politics, but um uh, you know, 63%, I think, of our organization is women of the staff members. So oh, there's also a, a feeling of obligation to push it and pave the path for them, right? Is, so, that, is that a conscious thought that you have? I mean, do you uh, think you do? Okay. Interesting. Okay. And it's in, it, so don't, don't think badly of me for this, but I what? don't, I don't, I, it's something that never occurs to me. Now, you know, it's not my cross to bear, right? I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not the one that that, that you know, people you know, don't immediately come up to in that situation that you just described. I haven't been in your shoes. 
Um, but as a professional, you know, um, you know, my, my CFO is, is a woman. Um, and you know, she's, you know, my peer for all intents and purposes. And it, it never even occurs to me, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't. That's great. Does I'm happy to do that. <laughs> and it, but, but it really hasn't. If I look back on my whole career and it's funny, as you were talking, uh, I just recently interviewed a friend who's a VP with Disney. She's been with Disney uh, right, uh, since two years out of school. And she's, you know, so she's in her, you know, 20 plus years. My sister, I interviewed um, not too long ago. She's a VP with Hilton. She's been there since her you know, first. Now she has us both beat, Jody. She, I, I, if, she, if she's listening, I'll have her, uh, you know, I'm sure I'll hear from her if I'm wrong. But I think her first uh, salary was, she was making $8 an hour at in Atlanta Hilton after graduating from college. I'm sure my parents were thrilled. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right. But um, the, uh, so I'm surrounded by, you know, friends and, and family who um, have succeeded. And, and as you were talking, and I didn't think about this prior to um, getting on today, that these women who, who I've interviewed have consistently been in their role for a long time and succeeded. And I have to stop and think about, it. I don't know how many guys I know that, that have had that longevity. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a, maybe a lesson there. I don't know that <laughs> what it is, or we're going to figure it out right now, but it's, I guess it's, it's, it's disappointing to hear that that still today is a thought because I, in my world, I would say, I would go, really, is, are we still doing that? <laughs> like, I don't, it seems ridiculous. It, 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 it does, but it is a, it is a consistent thought that I have in my role in leading an organization that has a strong woman, um, you know, workforce to consistently think about how to make sure they have that opportunity and that, you know, you know, try to break through the, you know, the barrier being, you know, now, would I ever want my legacy to be that, you know, oh, she's the first female CEO? Absolutely not. That's not a right, right. legacy that, you know, that I, I want. Um, but I want to make sure that the you know, any path that I can pave is going to be something that makes it just a little bit easier um, for people. So you, you've you clearly, you know, done it, but what, what advice would you give to you know, young women who are ambitious and, and want to succeed? I mean, as far as uh, dealing, dealing with that challenge? Yeah, I think um, using your voice, using your voice, you know, it is very easy to, um, to not, and especially if you get kind of, you know, pushed down every now and then, you know, and so when you were talking earlier about, you know, the other strong women in, in your, in your world, I was thinking, yeah, tenacious, you know, tenacity is probably, you know, a, a trait, and I think most leaders need that, right, but um, to, to, to use your voice, to not be shy and afraid to speak up and, you know, find yourself at, find a place for you to be, you know, at the, you know, at the table and then reach back and help other women, right? It's the same thing. So networking and learning um, from others, you know, I think that those things are all extremely, you know, extremely valuable. So it's it's a bit of a dangerous ground these days to be talking about gender. Right, I know. So I to go, you can cut this if you want. <laughs> no, no, we cut nothing. We don't. No. I, and that's part of the fun of this and the risk. Is it no? They, they, yeah, right. And there's every once in a while. I didn't know she was going to take me down that rabbit hole. Oh, this is, trust me, this one's easy. Uh, there's you know, when when. Uh, I do a different, another podcast with um, our HR director, who's about the most non-HR person you could ever meet, and we challenge each other with with you know with um, almost, I guess uncomfortable topics or not uncomfortable for us, but in our divisive world where there's very strong opinions on every side of every issue, you, you know you have to almost commit that you're not you're going to say you're going to be honest, you're going to be genuine, and let other people decide how they feel about it, right? Like that's not up to me. <laughs> decide how people feel about what I say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, so here's my, here's my developing theory. And I think I just mentioned this on a podcast that I was on the other day is when I think of the women who are, who are successful, um, it, it, successful women with children, you have to be hyper organized. You have to be, you know, just proficient and efficient at whatever you do because you don't have time not to be. And as a father of four, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a pretty attentive, attentive and involved dad. I, I mean, by any you know, logical measurement. 
But my responsibilities have always paled in comparison to what my wife's have been in terms of, you know, the detail stuff, right? I mean, the, the little stuff. And now every relationship is different and every household is different. I get that. But I think to, um, I think that you have to be superior um, to be a, a mother who's working and ambitious, especially in a, a stressful, you know, challenging environment with lots of responsibility. Um, because you're not gonna be able to do it otherwise. So like, it almost makes you better. And, and, and I don't know if that sounds crazy, but that's sort of the, something I've thought about a few times lately. Yeah, I think you get, you do get a chance to hone the skills of details, you know, just call it project management, not that your children are projects, but you know, like all of those things. They're very much projects. (laughs) Mine, mine, Mine are, you know, we are a little bit of a, different household though um you know and we took a risk early on in the career we my husband and I had had both you could see our careers were kind of you know taking off and he had owned a a company and a business and I was kind of continuing to move up and we decided that this that life stunk that it was really and so we made a conscious decision to follow my career and you know wait all of those things out and he was a stay-at-home dad for years, for years. And it's interesting how we actually were very prepared from our move from Ohio because that that actually happened about six months before we actually moved to Orlando. And you look back and you're like, oh, we were getting prepared to (laughs) be able to make that move so that I could continue to kind of figure all things out, you know, by, by starting a new job and he could really make sure that the kids got, you know, the kids got settled, which was great because it ended up leading to an amazing, um, um, you know, career discovery for him himself. You know, he does uh, renovates homes and stuff now and gets to do that on his own schedule. So, you know, by unleashing himself, he found a, a different passion, but he was that person who said, you know what, I'm, I'm in your corner and I'm going to help support you and figure, you know, this out. So it, it's, I, I think that's really, really, really cool because, you know, to have a successful relationship, it has to be a partnership and it has to work for, for the individuals, whatever that might be, right. That goes without saying, but you have to have balance, you know, that, 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 yeah. that just makes sense for you guys. And you know, this podcast is, is called Finding Career Zen. And the website that, that we've recently created is all about helping people find the thing that gives them happiness in their career, right? Success. And se- success to me, and I've talked about this quite a few times recently, uh, so I won't go into too much boring detail, but the success really is in the eye of the beholder, right? I used to think it was financial. I used to think it was, you know, advancing, but, but it, 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 I, I don't think that at all anymore. I mean, I think, gosh, you know, success is just such a personal thing to define because it, it's all about being happy and you can't be happy in your life unless you're happy with how you spend your, your day and your waking hours. And so it's all very much tied together. And I love the idea of a, tr- a non-traditional approach, right? To like, like what your husband does. He just doesn't, you know, he works for himself. He does it on his own schedule. He does it on time. And you, you haven't said this yet, but I would venture to guess he's probably a whole lot happier than he would otherwise be. My goodness, both of us and probably our kiddos too, right? You know, because it, it's just, you can, you can just get absorbed in the, in the career and, you know, something's going to fall, something's going to, and somebody's going to be unhappy or, you know, whatever, but yeah, it's, you know, probably not, it may not be for everybody, right? But to your point, it's, it's okay to figure out what works for you as a family, supporting career, finding passion so that it doesn't feel like a a job or this is, you know, something I have to trudge through. Um, but then also getting that chance to just, you know, live life. And right. I think that that is, it's always been, you know, part of our overall family dynamics and what it is that we've, you know, that we've strived for. That's really neat. It's, it's, um, it fits in just so well with, with the mission that I'm trying to, um, you know, perpetuate, which is, let's not follow rules that were put in place by other people a long time ago. And, um, you know, I have even rethought my, I, you know, I think about college a lot is college important, you know, for everyone, is it necessary? And I think, no, not for a lot of people. I don't think it should be the default 
answer that, uh, you know, we're sort of, I'd say our generation was taught that it, it should be. Um, and I mean, what's your take on that with, with young professionals right now? You have, you obviously have a lot of young folks working at the Y and we'll always have a, a young group. Um, where do you land with that? Yeah, that is such, it's such a, such a topic. And I, you know, from just a couple of phrases you just said, I'm in agreement with you. I think that people aren't, human beings are not uh, just, they're not a plan. There's not a, a blueprint for every single person. And some, some people, you know, want that here. I'm talking about how I'm such a learner all the way through, but most of my learning and self-discovery is been self-directed, right? So it's been directed yeah. through the topics that I'm most interested in, the reading or the audio books that I use or the, the workshop that I go to. Um, so I'm certainly not gonna throw away my college education, but so much of what I've learned is through my, also my experiences is through the network that I have created, you know, being able to bounce ideas, having thought partners, um, you know, from that perspective. So I really do start, I sit in the camp of, people should have their own individual plans and we shouldn't have such strict rules on, you know, if you don't have this, you don't get to pass go. Right. I, I just feel that is not, that is, um, so <laughs> I'm reading a book. I'm almost done with it. Um, it is called Humanocracy. 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 Okay. I'm writing it down. Uh, yeah. Well, I can't even say it. So <laughs> humanocracy. And it basically is talking about, about people being human beings versus being a plan or a roadmap and how do you tear down bureaucracy? And so again, I think education is important, but it doesn't have to be the most important thing for everybody from that traditional sense. And so if you put these kind of rules and bureaucracies in place, you might be missing out on the most talented person there. Those skill sets, um, you know, that, that you can't teach to people through even an education system. So, um, you know, I'm kind of a no rules rules person. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's, and that's really the, what I, what I'm enjoying so much uh, just over the past month and a half of, um, of Zengig being in existence of exploring that and your message that you just delivered is very consistent with how the successful people that I've encountered think. And so the rules, like you wonder who's putting these rules in place. So one of the things I, I was just thinking of is a, that a fortune 500 company, I worked for, mentioned, I worked for two big companies in my career and one had a rule in place that said, unless you have an MBA, you can't move past a manager level. What? I mean, think about how, like, that is, that's absurd. And the, the, the idea of being taught and learning, to me, are mutually exclusive, right? I mean, they can be. I don't need anyone to teach me. I have, yeah, I've learned through my own experiences. I've learned through my own efforts. You, you mentioned books that you read. You know, get on YouTube. You can, you can have, you know, you can receive four-year college education in a month on YouTube if you're so inclined. <laughs> And I, I think we're doing the you know, younger generation a disservice by not talking about these things and, and helping them realize that there's not one path to success, right? You, you mentioned, you said it, you never would have imagined that you would have your career, uh, let alone 33 years with one organization and still going, um, but that's where your path took you. And you couldn't, no one can predict that. Um, so for us to tell 18 year olds, 17 year olds, go do this you know, because <laughs> this is, this is your path to, to success. Is, yeah, sounds I'll go back, it goes back to the aquatic director job and moved into aquatic director and add fitness to it. Why didn't I only learn that by doing and, right. you know, I didn't learn, learn that because I went to a four year school, but I will tell you, I was, I felt like I was really good at my job. Um, you know, I figured out how to be a teacher in classes. So again, if you have a passion point, you'll find ways to learn and figure that out versus all of the step-by-step -step type, you know, approach. So I, 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 I want people to be curious. I want them to be inquisitive and I want them to be, that's why I, I truly believe critical thinking is developed, right? I, I don't, I want to work for some of my children. I want uh, creative problem solvers and, 
when you get to self-direct and choose your learning path and options, including the ways in which you learn, you know, I've, I've got, um, you know, one, one child that would only could, do audio books and, you know, would write all of their notes and another child that, you know, hey, mom, have you picked up this book lately, you know, or, um, you know, I I've got this book. So that's also part of it. There's just different vehicles to your point of YouTube, right? So there's different ve vehicles in doing that. And so I truly believe that if you get to direct that path versus this is the course load you have to take, you're going to be so much more well-rounded and, you know, and develop those critical, you know, thinking skills. It's, it's wild, Jody. It comes up on almost every conversation I've been having that this idea of the education system, what it is versus what it should be. And, um, you know, when I look at my, you know, you described your two, when I think of my four, so different, their interests, their, um, their capabilities, yeah, their, their, just all of it. And yet we, they all got stuck in the same classrooms in their respective years and, and with 30 other kids who were just as diverse as, as, as ours are from each other. And it just is like, no one that would, no one would create this on purpose, right? No one would say if you, if you had a blank slate, Hey, this, this makes sense because it, it just doesn't. And then we just continue to perpetuate that. Now I want, you know, if I'm going to have an orthopedic surgeon open me up, I do want them to have sufficient education. <laughs> I, I would say there's a few things out there that, you know, that need absolute skill. <laughs> but for most of us, right, myself certainly included in this, I there's no degree that could have prepared me or was even necessary to do what I've done throughout my entire professional career beyond you know, uh, the things I wish, quite frankly, I'd learned more about, you know, finances and um, you know, operations uh, related things that we really don't learn in school. So it's a, it's, it's, it's something that, that I've really been on my mind a lot lately. And so it's good to hear you say that as well. It's a very consistent message that I've been hearing. You know, we, we take an approach, you know, so I can talk about that personally, but like even at the YMCA, we take a pro an approach that how do we ready our high school, our high schoolers through high school initiative type programs that we have, you know, whether it's volunteer programs, a leaders program or youth in government, like we have all kinds of real specific right. types of programs that prepares them for career, you know, and if some of them, it takes them to college which could be university, which could be two-year school, or it takes you to, you know, an internship type thing. But, you know, being able to understand that they all are going to, you know, respond differently in different, you know, moments in time. What we don't want them to do, right, is go into a low-wage job that, you know, doesn't allow for them to create a comfortable lifestyle. Right, right. Yeah, that that is um, it to be avoided. And and the good news is, and as we, as I've spent more time looking at various um, career opportunities. So that's one of the things that we're doing on the website is is creating um, what we're, we call career guides. Um, you know, how do I become? You, you know, you name it. Right. We're trying to capture as many roles as we can, and it's even though I know this, I mean, I've been in staffing a long time, the variety of opportunities there are, and it's only growing thanks to the internet, thanks to technology. And even though there's, yeah, there's a lot of negativity right now in the world, in our country, um, there's never been a time of better opportunity. There's never been a better time to be alive. And so I think technology is going to help us solve those low wage jobs as, as we go forward and, and allow us to, you know, have more time to think and to be free and to, and to, um, and to produce, you know, advancement. So I, I it's exciting, um, but we have a lot of challenges along the way, right? That, um, but yeah, leaders like you, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna help solve them. So um, I, it, I, I really appreciate the way your, your, your perspective on all of this. So I've, I've kept you for a while. I told you that I was gonna keep an eye on the clock because I know you're busy, but I do have to ask you one more question. So the, as I mentioned, the, um, the title of the podcast is, is Finding Career Zen. So after you know, this time you know, with the why, have you found Career Zen? You know, I would say this moment, uh, you know, ask me tomorrow, ask me next week, you know, but I would say at this moment, if you looked at it globally and overall, 
you know, the answer would be an astounding yes. There's always challenges. There's, it's always going to be, you know, what that is. But um, I found a passion for, you know, the position that I have and the, the things that I that I do. And that's everything from the external to the community to the internal to, you know, the, the, the team members. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't be more blessed and thrilled with, um, you know, what this career has given me and, you know, and, and I feel really, you know, comfortable um, at where I have from that Zen perspective as, you know, as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's, that's what, you know, everyone should aspire to be able to say in their own career. And, um, you yeah, know, you've earned it, right? I mean, that doesn't come without a lot of hard work. It doesn't come out with a lot of effort. You've moved your family. You've, you've, you've said yes to jobs that you had to figure out on the way, um, you know, as you <laughs> figure it out as you go. And, and I think those are, you know, some of the traits that I, it's why I like, you know, having these conversations because I want people to hear that, you know, nothing, it wasn't handed to you. It didn't come easily. It didn't come quickly. And I'm sure, like you said, there were many days where that answer would have differed probably, you know? So um, the goal is not, you know, I never tell anyone expect success, you know, quickly and expect it easily, quite the opposite. Like everyone that I know, and it's such a consistent theme um, who, who achieves that level of, of career happiness and, and is, has to, has to earn it and, and has to do it over time. So it's, um, I love that answer and, and thank you for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, it's Friday afternoon and um, any, any big plans uh, for the weekend before I let you go? Well, there's a little more work on the horizon. So okay. all the kiddos are getting ready to go back to school, right? So that comes with events for us and serving the community. We've got two big um, Hope Fest back to school events at our Wayne Dench Y and our South Orlando Y this weekend. So awesome. we're going to do that and, um, you know, just go out and hand out backpacks and do haircuts and, you know, um, uh, screenings, health screenings and all that can just serve the kiddos. So Neat. Kind well, of looking forward to that. So I feel like I get to play a little bit, you know, by actually getting to participate in our programs. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm not ready to do it yet. I just finished coaching a couple months ago, my last um, basketball season in middle school with, with my now, you know, young, my youngest who's now a high schooler. And so I'm done. I have no one to coach anymore. And so everyone keeps asking, are you going to go back? And I'm like, eventually, not quite yet. I'm retired for the moment. <laughs> little but, break. <laughs> and there, there was nothing like, you know, just the five-year-olds running around on the soccer field on a Saturday, you know, so, like someone needs to have a grandbaby, then I can do yeah, it. I know, I know. I, I kind of put that pressure too a little bit, like, come on. That's right. The clock's ticking. That's right. Well, awesome. Jody, thank you so much for joining today. Really sure. appreciate it. And um, if you know, everyone listening, we um, would appreciate if you uh, rate us and review us always. And, and thank you for listening and have a great rest of your day. So thank you again. Thank you.